And we'll have Mr. O'Connell come around the corner here, have a seat. Nice to meet you in person. Yes, sir. We uh, chatted with the head coach the day he was officially introduced, but that was, of course, by phone or by special carrier pigeon. And welcome. Dan, thank you very much. How are you guys doing? What would you very, think? Very well. well, we were saying, my producer uh, slash sidekick, Justin Gard, he was watching you because, you know, in the media business, as you know, well, you were a media member. You know I this. I was, We yes. analyze everything, <laughs> even stuff we probably shouldn't. And he's watching you come over here, and he said, this guy, he looks, he looks pretty confident right here. He looks like, hey. And I said, well, he's probably saying, what's the big deal being a head coach? They make it sound so difficult. We accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish day one. <laughs> uh, are you as confident as that? And you finished early. You finished early today, correct? Yeah. My biggest thing today was we're obviously on some league-wide rules. They call it the ramp-up period. So we're kind of on a tight clock. Can you get in the work that you need to get in day one while still being you know, within the confines of the rules? And we actually shaved about three minutes off just by yeah. guys flying around and, and practicing really fast. We kept everybody off the ground. We're still just in helmets. Um, which is very similar to what we were in the spring. But right. obviously, you know, we were doing a lot more kind of lower tempo jog through type things above that neck work. And uh, so for the guys to come out and play fast, some ones versus ones work, some ones versus twos, um, and come out pretty clean, um, we're really excited about it. So if uh, correct me if I have these numbers wrong, but my understanding is you, you can have, a team can have as many as 16 padded practices. Yep. Uh, but you, I think, are choosing 11. Yep. Tell us a little bit about your thinking there. What went into that? Why particularly that number? Yeah, it's uh, it's unique, too, because of how our schedule worked out. Um, we'll get those full-speeded days, full full pad days. We'll be full speed every day. But just those full days, I told the team last night, you know, when we go, we got to go. And people that come out uh, to, to our facility for training camp, they will feel that. They'll feel that urgency, that energy. Um, to know that those are big time growth days for our whole team and, and we'll do a lot of competitive work then. But with the schedule, we have a Sunday preseason game on the road. Um, so what that does is that gives us an extra day before. Ah. But a lot of times with the sports science side of things, you stack too many of those days together. You start to see, you know, guys' numbers really spike, you know, from a, a total yardage and, and high speed yard standpoint. We just want to be able to, you know, ramp it up, then pull it back. And then when we got to go, we got to go. But to get those 11 days being maximized, you really can't, in my opinion, jump on top of these guys with four or five uh, padded practices in, the row, in a row. And really the rules kind of hold that back. And if you want to extend, quote, unquote, training camp a little bit further, sure. um, you know, you can catch up on those padded practices on the back end, which we will do um, towards the 53 and how we'll break up who plays and who doesn't in the preseason. But uh, it's all built on – you know, me really trusting Tyler Williams and, and our sports science staff to, to make sure that we, A, we're able to evaluate our guys going full speed and, and what kind of team we want to build. But we want to have all these guys. We want to have every single one of the 53 guys we want on this roster and our practice squad. We want those guys healthy coming out of training camp. And those two days against the Niners, they're both padded practices back-to-back. Back, yeah. And I can promise you that will be a little bit different than just coming out here against Vikings on Vikings uh, with a physical team like that coming in. The, the, the age-old question, and I've asked this of many coaches over the years, even before things have sort of changed in terms of how much contact is, is even demanded by, by coaches, in part for the reason that you just lay out, is it's still football. It is still – it's not – touch football it's still tackle football it's still a very violent game so how do you factor in hitting that sweet spot between not being stupid and reckless in 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 wearing your players down and getting them prepared for the rigors of a national football league season and and that first game yeah it's a great question because when i look at it that's one of the reasons you go out and you hire and Ed Donatel, Mike Pettin is an assistant head coach. We've got Greg Minuski. We've got Durante. We've got guys that are experienced defensive coaches in this league. Matt Daniels played special teams and was a, you know, they call him hat for a reason because he used to obviously <laughs> lay the hat when he played. So I've got some coaches that understand, and they used to be in the old NFL where, hey, you were, you know, smacking heads every day and, and uh, you know, only the strong survive type of thing. And then they've had to transition through that into what we now you know deal with from a rule standpoint but also we're we understand more we're able to track more data and not that data drives 
everything, but when you have it, if you're not using it as a tool to take care of your football team, I think it's you know doing a real disservice to the team. So I rely on those guys, and I challenged our staff last week. I said, you know, I want you guys to really come up with ways, unique ways, to make sure that we're a good tackling football team, no matter how much guys play or don't play in the preseasons to be determined. But uh, I, I think that's coaching, and I think that's something we really got to hang our hat on is finding those ways to really teach that technique, teach the fundamentals, teach guys angles, all those things. And then when we do compete and, and there's places to really see where guys could of made a game-changing tackle you know a third and one and, sure. and 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 it might be a tag off play but there ain't no way you were making that tackle with the angle you took and you can coach those things up and then ultimately in the run game you know we're going to rely on a lot of guys that have been doing it a lot mm. a, a long time Harrison Smith Eric Hendricks Daniil Z um, we've got Harrison Phillips and DT in the middle uh, Jordan Hicks obviously there next to EK so guys that have you know, 100 tackle type players, guys that have made a lot of plays in this league and rely on them being fresh, ready to go mentally and physically. But then, you know, when it's time to go, like we said last night in our team meeting, we're going. First practice is in the books. We're at TCO Performance Center chatting with head coach Kevin O'Connell. When you're analyzing sort of where this, the, the team you inherited and trying to figure out where you want to go, which is obviously get better than certainly last year and then get into the playoffs and then, and, and then make a move. Would you say it's more important that this team takes another step offensively or that it needs to take a really big step defensively based on the fact that this defense, statistically in a lot of other ways, was nowhere near as good as it often was, had been under the previous regime and Mike Zimmer? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we obviously have had a lot of dialogue about what we apologize for the uh, technical snafu. Very rare these days, but it happens every once in a while. We're chatting with uh, with, with Kevin O'Connell, and we were you were about, I think, beginning to answer the question about offense improvement versus defensive improvement in terms of moving forward. Yeah, I was so excited about the answer. <laughs> I might have took down the whole operation here. But, uh, no, I think, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about what type of football team we're building here. There's a lot to be determined personnel-wise, you know, ultimately what that will be. We have philosophies, uh, you know, in those three phases. But ultimately, you know, that's what we do as coaches is take those philosophies and really figure out how we can highlight uh, players that can help us win football games and, and week in and week out in this league, how we're going to win is really, really important to not only figure out as coaches, but deliver that message to our team of, of what's going to be important to do or maybe don't do this week against that particular team. But whatever has happened with this team in the past, I just know one thing. I, I know I've got a lot of respect uh, for this organization and, and having played this organization multiple times. Um, I know we've got a good roster. I know we've got a good group of players that are hungry to continue to learn our philosophies and our football uh, way of doing things. And, and then we just continue out throughout the month to really figure out what that looks like. And, and really the word that hits my brain, Dan, is identity. Like what is the identity at our core? What does that look like? And it does not have to be like what I've been in the past at other spots. Maybe it will be, maybe it won't. But ultimately this team, the 2022 Vikings, will make that ident identity up themselves. You know, uh, you're, I know your job isn't to look back in terms of what took place before here because it doesn't do you any good other than I'm sure look at a lot of tape and a lot of film and maybe learn a lot about the, the, the players you still have here. But one of the things that has come up over the offseason is occasionally there have been players, some of them still here, some not, who felt, who said, who, who expressed frustration. They felt that it was a little bit too tight here at times, a little bit too demanding at times in a way that made it difficult for players to uh, relax, the question of the culture of fear. Some of that stuff can be oversimplified. But I ask it, I bring this up because I'm curious, as a, play, as a coach who's been around now a little bit, did you sense when you came here that you were trying to coach a team that has been emotionally wounded? And in terms of the mental side, is that something you were conscious of that you observed and has been part of how you've decided to go forward? Or what, what do you make of that whole issue? Yeah, I, I definitely would not say that. The first thing I noticed, um, really from day one, getting a chance to first have dialogue with our players, you know, especially our leadership. We've got a leadership group. Um, that I've been in pretty constant contact with since really day one. Um, and what I noticed is, and very quickly, I, I feel like we've got great leadership on this team. Um, I feel like we've got a good locker room. The foundation 
of understanding kind of where we wanted to go from a culture standpoint, regardless of what it was before. Um, I was not here for that. What I do know is I feel very strongly about, uh, you know, how I want our building to operate. I feel strongly about how I want to empower players and our leadership to have that kind of ownership over our team. And there really shouldn't be much to have fear of or worry about or have anxiety when the communication is at a premium. I tell our team and my team, I tell them what the expectation is. Do we go out and reach that expectation? Do we not? And if we don't, we got to be able to have real conversations to fix those things and then reset, reevaluate, and, and go try to win football games. So ultimately, I just believe in uh, you know building up a player owner ship type of uh, atmosphere and you do that and you build that culture and, and all those things that some folks may not think matter I can tell you right now when you start hitting the adversity of a 17 NF game NFL season you rely on that you don't rely on you know pointing fingers or starting to pull apart from the seams you bond closer and you rely on that culture and it's really tested in this league week in and week out and you're ultimately going to find out you won't know until that adversity comes. I've told our team many times, you know, I feel great about what we've been able to do early on. I feel great about the transition as we've started training camp, but we will ultimately find out, like every team in this league does, week in and week out in this league, what we are and who we are. Even with what you are, the atmosphere you are attempting to set up here, do you expect to get tested by players? Is it still human nature that players are going to test you because there's a part of this, as you say, that is also about you being honest enough with them, no matter what you're trying to set up in terms of happy feelings, in terms of we ain't, do, we ain't getting this done. This is not going to work for us. If we want to get to where we want to go, that we've got to do this better, this better, and that better. Yeah, and I think you, the natural reaction hearing about words like culture and hearing about words like positive work environment is happy feelings and that's very very uh, you're absolutely right to think that but what i would challenge people to understand is once you've built that culture once you've had the relationships and you build it up so they know who you are every single day you're the consistent leader out in front good times bad times they know who you are guess what you can do you can coach them really hard and when they feel like they're holding each other accountable we can hold them accountable and vice versa they can hold us accountable to the things that we say how we're coaching them, what we're asking them to do. And then ultimately, if we all have that ownership, we all look inward when things do get difficult. I can promise you, you know, your culture is where you want it to be. What, what did you appreciate it from, a, from a coach when you were a player? And what did you tend to reject? And how much did that factor into the approach that you're attempting? To yeah, the appreci I appreciated something that's very simple, and that's honesty. Um, and, and I think you don't want to throw that around uh, in a world where – you do have to cut a roster from 90 to 53. You do have to have really hard conversations. That's why the conversations you have long before that matter when you lay out objectives for not just your team, not just your offense, your defense, your special teams, but on an individual level. I've challenged our position coaches to really look closely at what individual players on our team need to do to make our football team. And ultimately, once we've made our football team, what the roles on these teams lo on this team looks like for how we're going to best win football games. Because ultimately, the 53 guys we take uh, into that first game at home against Green Bay are going to be the guys we believe give us the best chance to win football games. And that decision will be made week in and week out, who's active, who's not. Um, and, and sometimes those are really tough conversations. But the honesty that you look a guy in the eye and you're willing to do that all comes back to the foundation that you build from uh, you know really April on and then and then ultimately you know the second part of your question was if you can remind me I don't even remember well I, I guess what you accepted and rejected and how much it played into the the approach you're taking absolutely and I think that that's the beauty of when I look back at my football journey I've been able to be blessed to be around a lot of different kind of coaches when you really peel back and you look at it a lot of similar characteristics a lot of different ways to do it a lot of different ways to motivate a team to challenge a team to get the best out of a team um, but but ways that I've been able to kind of absorb and make my own because ultimately authenticity and honesty are the things that I want to live by coaching this team and it's going to get hard to do that at times with the nature of this league but I you know I'm pretty steadfast in maintaining that the uh, we're chatting with Vikings head coach uh, Kevin O'Connell about a lot of good stuff I you you guys last year in LA obviously got a lot of good stuff out of a quarterback you went and got him yep. and you 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 challenged him to make some really tough plays Sometimes he failed. There were a couple of pick sixes I remember in there, but a lot of times he succeeded, especially at the moment of truth. So when you look back on that, how, do, how can you apply that to here? In other words, what did you get out of him, you think, and, and 
what do you need to get out of number eight to take it to that next step so that you guys aren't only top 10 in a lot of yardage, a lot of categories, but also top 10 in scoring, which yep. I don't believe this team was. W w how do the two things, do the, do the, are the two things connected, do you think, or are they two completely different kinds of quarterbacks? Well, I think you get two guys that have played a lot of football, you know, when I, when I was first got to be around uh, either one of those guys. And really, I was first around Kirk years ago um, and had that relationship. But in regards to last year, you know, when we, you make a decision as an organization to make a change at that position and go get a guy, we identified Matthew as somebody we really thought we could build something around, really studying what he had done over a long period of time in some different systems. Uh, you know, we were able to kind of evolve and change and still remain true to what the foundation of the offense was and how it would best help us win football games. And ultimately with Kirk, that's the plan. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're hard at work right now transitioning our offensive systems to what we're going to be here. And it may look a lot like what we did in L.A. at times, and then other times it might be unrecognizable to even people I coached with in Los Angeles, because ultimately we're going to do what we think gives us advantages. We're going to use our tools that we build in this offense to apply pressure to defenses, how we see fit. Um, and that can change week in and week out. It can be consistent throughout the season. But I can tell you uh, that we're going to use our personnel. We're, we've evaluated this roster. We're going to put guys in position throughout this training camp to kind of see what they're capable of, multi-versatile roles for some guys. And then ultimately, you know, the answer is, does this help the quarterback play well? Does this help the O-line? you know, hold up against a lot of really good pass rushers, and then ultimately how are you using your playmakers to fit that all together? What is acceptable risk by a quarterback in your system? Yeah, I think we build a system where – uh, a lot of times, you know, the number one question in our passing game is we're trying to build things so that we can, you know, have a quarterback play with comfort and, and worry about timing and rhythm and not so much where am I starting my read? Where am I against this coverage? I'm going to do this against that coverage. I'm going to do this. We try to build a system with answers and, and then quarterbacks just have to drop back in rhythm, you know, with great technique, fundamentals, poise in the pocket and, and go through progressions uh, that we try to define, uh, you know, to help them eliminate get through get through progressions throw completions put the ball in play you guys will hear me say a lot uh, because I do think as dynamic as defenses are in this league I still think you mentioned it already they still have to tackle in space and if we can get people in space uh, with a good matchup that's a bonus that's you know that's the icing on top but uh, obviously we uh, you know we're going to try to build it in a way where that quarterback it all plays through his rhythm his eyes um, and running the football does help you know <laughs> as a side note there well that's the the funny thing because I think people assume because McVay is young I don't know who I was talking to about this the other day that well all he you know then by that definition he doesn't ever he he's bored with the ground game isn't interested in it even is more liberal in terms of the, the, the risks that he takes in terms of game management, which I don't think you could speak to it because you were there, is necessarily true, right? I mean, there's always going to be a balance, and I don't think you're, you're bored with the running game, are you? No, and I think the, the game management decisions, how you win football games, it might not be, you know, how you register statistics and right. fantasy football you know, teams out there might be upset sometimes, but you have to navigate through four quarters of football games in this, N in this NFL league that, you know, it takes decisions being made out of the best interest of the team. You know, not any individual player, um, not any individual, you know, one side of the ball over the other. Uh, when we have an advantage in one phase of, of football uh, on offense or defense, we're going to schematically play that game and, and make decisions based upon that. And if it doesn't work out, uh, that's that's on us, and, and, and that's on us as a team and our players and our coaching staff to understand we made a decision. We wanted to play the game a certain way. We did, and it did not work out. But you have to go through that process, and that's where situational football comes into play, understanding who you're playing, where you're playing. You know, what's the, what's the, the rhythm of the game going like where, you know, possible momentum swings could be really life and death in a football game nowadays in the NFL, and then how you control the clock, both the end of the first half, the end of games, how you're going to, if you're winning, how you're going to put it away. If you're not, how are you going to go chase that victory down and whatever you need to do to do that, you got to be willing to make those decisions. Two last things for Kevin O'Connell. I've kept you too long. I appreciate the time. It's all Head good. Vikings coach. You mentioned, you know, this, is, this was a challenge for this club. This is a team in terms of at end of halves and at end of games, Part of the reason they ended up with the record they did was they didn't make enough plays, and that, of course, often determines the difference between good teams and, and okay teams or even mediocre teams. So everybody now, I think, out there believes, well, there's, we've got a million coaches, so you need to have 
a game manager coach, that there's a guy who basically then is a tool that the head coach can use to help decide things like what what the, the analytics suggest on whether to go for it on fourth down here, how to use your timeouts. How do you navigate all of that? Do you have somebody you've designated for that? Is that ultimately your job? How are you handling that part of it? I do. I do. We hired a, a, a kid named Ryan Cordell, and, and really I shouldn't say kid, but he, <laughs> we hired him away from Cleveland. I had worked with him in the past. Um, when he was responsible for that role at some other places. And uh, he's fantastic. He's very, very intelligent, has a great way about understanding how to deliver that data. Because the one thing, uh, two things about analytics, right? Yeah, I, I am uh, absolutely a fan of using those, that data as a tool. But a couple questions. What, what does that data come from? Where is that collected from? Who is determining the different variables in that? And, and ultimately, that's where I think week in and week out in this league, they change. If, if you're a team that thinks you can just use the chart and go by the chart, live and die by the chart, well, there may be a quarterback on the other side that has something to do Great with, point. with saying, yep. you know, with what that may mean. And ultimately, not that you ever play scared. It may be time to hit the gas at times, but ultimately, Ryan will have a huge role in that. And I also think, you know, a guy like Mike Pettin, there's a reason why he's here. He's, a, he's made those decisions before. He's been a head coach on the other side of the ball which I think is really important because now he can really play some of that yin and yang with me of making good decisions for our team when maybe I know, you know, there's a look out there. We got ourselves one. You know, I can call this play right now and end this thing right now, but is that the right thing to do mm -hmm. for our team or is that the right thing to do for J.J. to score another touchdown? That's where I need to be able to really be able to oversee and, and rely on my conversations. And quite honestly, Dan, some of those conversations happened long before Sunday at, at 12 o'clock at U.S. Bank Stadium. They happen throughout the week. We'll have meetings to prepare our mindset for what type of game. Can we set those variables, at least the, the ones that we know will not change, the who the when, the what, and, and then obviously as that game plays out, how are we playing, what are we doing well, or like in the Super Bowl, you know, we thought we would run the ball well in the Super Bowl. We did not. They had a great plan to take away our run game. Then we lose Odell Beckham, and ultimately we had to rely on a, a different variation that, you know, I'm not sure, you know, even Rams fans recognized in the second half of that game, but it required us to adapt and do what we had to do to win that football game or at least give ourselves a chance uh, to score 23 points, which was enough to win that game. So ultimately, maybe it's not about the stats. Maybe it's not about scoring the most points all the time. Obviously, that helps you win a football game, but uh, playing the, each one of those games as its own and, and making really good decisions, I'll be learning throughout. Let's make no mistake about it. Um, I by no means have all the answers, but I'm going to put in every bit of work uh, that I have to do and with our coaching staff and, more importantly, teach our players so that when those moments come, you know, there's, we can eliminate some anxiety, eliminate the clutter in their minds uh, so they pretty much know what's coming. Last question to that end. How do you prepare or how are you preparing to call plays? Right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's something that I got a chance to do quite a bit, uh, you know, not, all, not really in the game setting in, in L.A., but, but Sean um, really – I was able to develop as a coach there. I was able to do it very – you know, people don't understand that, I, I you know, obviously when – uh, I was able to do it late in Washington, right. kind of out of necessity when, when a change was made there um, with a lot of young players and, and playing four or five rookies at the skill positions at one time. I learned a ton that year, and, and that was maybe uh, as big, if not greater, than you know the last couple of years being around Sean McVay day in and day out, minute to minute, uh, of how you build plans and how you go about taking that plan to the game. So ultimately, A, your quarterback is comfortable with the plan, um, but your team, all 11 guys out there, understand exactly what to do, uh, how to do it, and then how are we applying pressure? How are we in this day and age, um, you know, how can we be in attack mode? That's one of our football philosophy core characteristics is we want to attack, and we want to be in attack mode, and that looks like a lot of different things uh, to the common eye, but we're going to use all those tools that we have. Appreciate the time very much. Yeah, Good to have you. you. I hope to chat uh, sometime soon down the line. Yeah, Good luck. Th thank you very much. Thanks. Kevin O'Connell, the uh, Vikings coach, day one of uh, Vikings training camp. First tra uh, practices are in the books. They got done early, and uh, he was kind enough to give us a lot of time. We appreciate your patience, too, because we had a little bit of a, of a glitch. Thank you so much. No, I don't think it, I don't think it, it was. But it helps that you've, you've been in the media, so to that extent, probably you're even used to it. So thanks again.